Hello and welcome back to Boring Dad Gaming, where today we're going to be playing some more Road Warden. So let's dive into our save. Um, so in the last episode we made it to White Marshes, um, which is uh, the city, or sort of the village I should say, in the swamps uh, that uses the undead as uh, sort of like a servant caste really, I suppose, doing all their labour and stuff. Um, our personal situation is we're barely alive, barely fed, <laughs> barely clean. Um, our armor's alright, and we've got a bit of magic left. Um, it is morning, so we've got 13 and a half hours before dusk, and we've got 35 days left uh, on our sort of ti uh, t calendar time limit uh, for this uh, for the game. That's out of 40, so we spent five days, and we've, we've achieved this much in five days, which I think is, uh, yeah, not too bad. Uh, but White Marshes looks to be a little bit of a dead end down here. Um, so let's go back to the old forest garden and uh, head out into the next section. As you ride past the fields, one of the local farmers enters the road, gesturing for you to stop. He's holding a rusty sickle and carries a basket on his back, filled with various weeds and a sharpened club. His patched, worn tunic is neglected, but fitting for a farmer. The lean years left his face skinny and his teeth crooked, but his sad eyes hold heartwarming kindness. Oi there, Warden. He has a thick local accent. I've been wondering just now. There's a small matter you see. Do you know how to read? Uh, now, I understand, uh, just from, a, again, a post on the Steam forums, that only the scholar class, which you pick at, uh, when you pick your class at the very start of the game, only the scholar class is actually able to read. So, even though we're a mage background, we, we can't read. I guess that's why with all the signposts, um, and the letters in the dolmen, now that I think about it, we, we couldn't it didn't even try to read. Uh, we just looked at the sort of the pictograms. So, yeah, I don't, I'm afraid. I see. He gives you a sad smile. But still, you, you've a horse, I mean. He raises his eyes as if to make it clear he's aware that you're sitting in a saddle. It is. You ride places. Uh, give me a few moments. Without waiting for your response, he runs to the village and returns to you with a small sack in his hands. How about you take it to someone smart? He unwraps the package and reveals a large wax tablet made of bone. It's a letter from someone I care about, but I'm not sure what it says. I'll give you a coin once you read it for me. You take the tablet from his open palm. It's fancy, unlike the wooden ones. On its back you find an engraving portraying a large furry beast. Made for troll from a troll's hip, the farmer says proudly. Uh, that's a pretty tablet. He puts his hands on his sides. His smile is filled with pride. Did it myself with cold nights and little iron. Takes uh, thinking to keep your hands busy. Oh, I beg your pardon, I sneezed there, so that's why my voice went a little funny at the end of the last bit. Um, fine, I'll see you soon. He waves to you and steps away, clearing the path. I'll wait for you with the coin I promised. Very nice. So, we, yeah, so we'll continue up to the uh, arrow east that we were about to go to. You leave the wetlands behind. The pebbled road runs through the hillside, with tall grasses and rock faces above you, and dark, lush forests below. Chunks of this path were shaped by human tools, who knows how many centuries ago. To widen it, the builders dug through the uneven boulders and used rocks and logs to fill up the cavities with thousands of rocks, each one smaller than your fist. While you have a good view of what's happening between the trees on your right, the bushes and shrubs grow so densely between them that you can't imagine entering these woods on your own. Further south, there are plumes of smoke. Well, they must be coming from white marshes. At the top of the hill, you reach a stone wall, a quiet place with no smoke coming from behind it. You look inside and see the glimpse of a peaceful ruin. While the main road is beaten and easy for the hooves, the destroyed gate and the remains of the front yard are almost reclaimed by the short grasses. You seek any suspicious movement, but the place seems to be free of inhabitants larger than a falcon. The air is fresh. The wind shakes the tree crowns gently. I enter the yard. The hamlet could be a hunter's shelter, a military outpost, a storage for traders, but you spot no fresh human trails. The damaged door and gate are years old, soggy and mouldy, and judging by the squirrels, birds and the animal feces you see in the grass, this place is but a part of the wilderness. The roof collapsed only a few years back, turning into food for mushrooms. The outer wall looks generations old, but it used to be maintained. 
Some of its materials came from different times and areas. Got a few choices of things to do here. Um, I think perhaps we go behind the building first, uh, rather than just marching inside, just to, you know, sort of check the perimeter, as it were. I don't need to go back to Roach. The chaos sparks right after you approach the tree stump, and the music's happening as well. The dusk fox's growl sounds like a hybrid of an obnoxious bird and an infant. One of the animals standing only a few feet away from you is jumping and showcasing its tiny, sharp teeth, and a raccoon-like black mask on the little head. The animal, with its thick, brownish-grey fur, seems more stout than any red fox. The second loud creature gets onto the tab table made of a halved trunk. Unlike the first one, it has brighter, golden fur. It bends one of its forelegs, observing you with its dark eyes. Not furious, nor scared. Rather sad and protective. Its growl turns into a miserable whine. The beasts are not even waist high, but their number may be an issue. There's another sound coming from behind you, and even more from the bushes nearby. We're very low on health. I don't want to risk a fight, because I don't know what might happen. Uh, no time to wait to kick one of them? I'd, no, I think that's an aggressive move. They'd, you don't attack a dog that's growling at you. I need to block their charge. Raise my hands and prepare myself to strike back. No, I think I'm going to step away and try and count them. Nope, we've taken damage. <laughs> Verge of death. You take a quick glance and evade the creature in front of you as it tries to bite your leg. But then You then feel the bite on your calf. The third larger fox was standing right behind you, and while loud, it's lumbering on its paws, not trying to hold you in place. So it's nipped us. The noises from the bushes belong to little pups, most likely harmless, though they're doing their best to imitate their guardian. So, we, yeah, so we've disturbed um, a little family of foxes. Vicious foxes. Take a step back. They're being protective of their cubs, so let's not... Let's not force a fight here. Um, since the one behind me already moved away, I should have noted that before, I'd run for it. You pass the weaker fox and run towards your belongings, encouraging the beasts to chase you all the way to the gate as they are growling with determination. For now, though, they stay in the shelter, filled with pride. You and Roach take a few steps away. So the creatures won't let me get close to the building. Fair enough, they might be more in there. Too exhausted to... Yeah, we've got no vitality yet again <laughs> for the third time in as many episodes. I could return here another day to try and scare them off, possibly, but it's greyed out now. So the only option available to us is the place was already abandoned, so I'll let the dust foxes stay. They don't threaten anyone, apart from me. Are you sure you want to leave this place to its fate? I mean, I don't have a choice, so yes. The dust foxes observe you as you climb up the saddle. They're growling and walking in circles. One of the pups knocks down their siblings, starting a playful fight. Yeah, so we've disturbed a little family group in an abandoned ruin. There's no reason to uh, attack them, not least because they'll probably kill us. Um, oh, what's this? Creepers? Oh, I can't... I can't get back to White Marshes. I would have to go to uh, the... Heat fields first and get the guy to let us back in. So I don't, I, but I don't need to return there for now anyway. But I have to be slightly aware of um, the time it's going to take to get somewhere to somewhere like the uh, where well, it's going to be Howler's Dell. It's going to be the nearest place we can rest, and that's three hours away. So we've got a bit of time. Oh God! Is there anything we can do to raise our vitality? Can't use your inventory right now. Okay, not sure why. You'll squeeze between the hills and the forests. The only larger beast you spot is a single saurian basking on a boulder, lazily observing you from a safe distance. Your ears catch the howls coming from the north, long and loud, and as you keep an eye on the rock ledges, you almost miss the drastic shift in the landscape. The forest turns into a lake, and the few plants growing next to the road mostly bear fruit. The road is not as reliable here as it was in the hills. Parts of it are a bit muddy, and the puddles disturb your ride. What's that noise? Uh, maybe the locals will maintain it before it gets swallowed by the lake. <clears throat> Can I use my inventory now? Um, be good to maybe eat. Increased nourishment. I mean, oof, I do need to do that. I think I've done that. Um, 
let's wear the hourglass, I mean, why not? Oh, I just, I need to get my health up. Character sheet, can I do the healing ritual? Or is that only when I'm sleeping? Ay, ay, ay. The deep, loud yells of howlers are piercing your ears, concealing any other sound in the area. They're sitting on branches and in the tall grass, not really trying to hide. Their thick black and gold furs cover their entire shells. Uh, and remember, shells is uh, used here to instead of the word body. So, black and gold fur covering their body. Aside from the charcoal black faces with roundish flat noses and wide nostrils, the younger members of the pack are about the size of your mount's head, but the larger ones would be chest high if it wasn't for the fact they walk on all fours. The long tails are like an additional arm, helping them climb, hang from the branches or hold food while they eat. They aren't particularly muscular, but when they form their pink lips into the shape of a cup to release their howls, their mouths are so wide they could fit your entire arm inside. As you listen to the shouts, you're reaching for your head. You feel a weird itch, but somehow you can't touch it. Oh god, what are they doing? Keep my distance. The whitish rawhide covers the grass like a blanket, surrounded by paw prints. The howlers don't wait for you to approach it. One of the larger ones jumps on the ground, leaning on its hands and challenging you with its gaze. It has rather blunt teeth. I am too exhausted to face them. Can't outrun the monkeys. Can't set my fish trap, because that's in uh, the ruined village. So I guess we travel once more. Head east. Oh, there's a little house. The lakeside is filled with the chirping of cicadas and crickets, as well as the roaring of beasts from the northern hills. Farther down the road you see yellow, tall grasses interwoven with flowers and bumblebees, while the peaceful water shines just as much as the wings of dragonflies. This road is often travelled, and the clatter of hooves carries far. Thanks to the vast field of view, the creatures hiding in the meadows are unlikely to jump on an animal as large as roach. In the distance you see a palisade and a large building set on the side of a crossroad. Once you get closer, you hear a conversation from behind the wall. Two men are arguing about if they really just heard a horse. Maybe they know some useful rumours. Roach carries you towards the open gate on its own, welcoming an opportunity to rest by pushing out the air loudly through its nostrils. A nearby wooden pen wouldn't offer much space for a horse, but should be enough for grazing and a nap. As you dismount, two men get up from the front stairs. Their clean-shaven faces reveal that they're in their early twenties. The first one is taller than you, broad-shouldered, and wears light brown pants and a darker jacket, both of them made of leather. With an inviting smile, he gets up and moves to open the enclosure. His steps are heavy and slow, but every movement is marked with carefulness, assuring he won't knock down anything or anyone. The second man looks as different from his colleague as the sun and the moon. He's unusually short and wears a heavy cloak made of black fur, so large it could cover his entire shell. He opens the door of the building, hides his hand and peeks into the room. Foggy! His voice is shrill and unconcerned. A messenger, come! I take off some of my bundles. Actually, he's in his early twenties, isn't he? So that made him sound a bit old. Uh, let my horse rest. The hanging barrel sways in the wind, marking the place as an inn or a tavern. Well, that's good. Another place to rest here in the north. The building resembles a merchant's house from Hovlevan, whitewashed and with oiled, elegant wooden beams. The fragile walls are high enough to avoid floods and snow, but you have no doubt that a troll, or even a pebbler, could easily break through them. The palisade is short, has hardly any support, and has no walkway for crossbowmen. Hardly enough for even a makeshift hamlet. Yet it's the open harbour that makes you uneasy. Aside from the fish, any creature, aquatic or not, could just walk into the yard undisturbed. The path is covered with paw prints and claw marks. Okay, so we've deduced it's better not to leave Roach outside during the night. Hmm. A black and white bird swoops into the water then flaps its wings and takes off with a silver twitching creature in its talons. The large man clears his throat. And what have we here? Coming from a far friend? Are there now horses in Howlers? His voice is stentorian, close to a shout. You recognise vaguely his accent from the city harbour. Um, we could be supportive and cordial. Quite far, kind soul. Roach came with me from Hovlevan. He nods appreciatively. A weird beast, I. A donkey that can kill a man. You notice he keeps quite a distance from it, and holds his hand close to his throwing club. 
haven't seen one in a while. The roads here ain't that bad, but they'll they'll take you north and east with ease. You hear heavy footsteps. A woman shows up in the door and looks at you from the top of the stairs. She's even more towering and stout than her son, the man who has just welcomed you, with a massive chest and a pear-shaped face with a prominent chin. Her movements are composed and confident. She may be older than 50, with a mixture of grey and dark blonde hair. She has only one arm, the left one, notably muscular and with a hand so large it could likely chop off Roach's head with a single strike, or crush yours like a berry. Through the slit of her robe, made of creamy, white, creamy worn fur, uh, you spot her trunk-like legs. Wow. She runs her eyes over your blade, armour and mount. Her lips form into something of a smile, distorted by the scar that runs through her mouth. That tall guy looks a lot like her. The tall man spreads his arms, forming a chain between you and his mother. Meet Foggy, friend. Ma, the rider has come to us from Hovlevan. Just look at his horse. His powerful voice turns timid, and he keeps turning his head from left to right. Too bad we have no hay. It looks hungry. The woman looks at him with amusement and then glances at your palfrey. Aye, a cute monster you've brought, but not enough fat on it. If it ever breaks a leg, bring it here and we'll smoke it for winter. She stretches out her only hand vaguely. What brings you to Foggy Lake, love? Just stopping by? Her voice is harsh, uh, like that of a traveller who spent too many autumn nights in cold tents, yet carries a hint of motherly concern. I close the animal pen behind me and head towards the stairs. You won't find another shelter in this part of the Dragonwoods, especially not in creeks. She scratches her broad chin with sausage-like fingers. You drink? I smile, in good company. That's what I like to hear. Her brief, powerful laughter is enough to scare away the birds from above the lake. Your mount lets out a fearful snort. Let's not wait then. Come, dear. Share a story with me in a mug. Without waiting for your response, she walks inside. The tall man takes a deep breath. Go ahead, we'll take care of your horse. He encourages you with a gesture. And by that he means... Oh, I mean, and by that he means he won't do anything with it. Adds the man in black fur. Whenever his screechy words follow the deep voices of his companions, he sounds like a brat. We're not feeding or washing beasts that we won't put in a stew, but we'll keep an eye on it. They find new spots to rest. The sight of a boat and a stool near the palisade. Uh, well, that's another word. I go up the stairs. Please feed me. Look after me. <laughs> the narrow segmented window shutters let in a lot of light without letting the beasts inside. The air is humid but carries not a hint of putridity. The heels of Foggy's boots makes her steps thunder even though the pla planks don't creak. Make yourself at home, she says without looking at you, heading into the trapdoor in the corner. I'll just grab a little something to eat. Your ears catch the screeches of hunting birds, but the wind that leaks in through the windows Oh, and the wind that leaks in through the windows. But other than that, the room is quiet. Uh, investigate the main hall. The room is crammed with stuff. The bear pelt on the ground would be a nice resting spot, but the place doesn't look like a real home. No chests, no cabinets for clothes, no toys or tools for simple crafts that would fill the time during rainy evenings. Living with so many windows in winter would be a struggle. One could clear this place in one morning and move all that's worth saving onto a single wagon. The only things of exceptional value are the cauldron, made of pricey steel, and the hanging head of an insect-like monster. Its mandibles don't move, the dim eyes seem, in, seem intact, and its armoured head tells a long story of survival through scratches and cuts. Now, let's just sit at the table and wait for her. We don't want to be poking around and stuff. You take a glance at the blood on the table, the scattered yellow feathers, and the bowl of guts and talons. You find yourself a clean stool, Foggy shows up soon, smiling, holding two cups in her hand, a bottle in her fingers and a cloth under her shoulder. She puts everything on a stool and wipes the table clean. Forget the mess, it's just part of the job, she explains without a hint of apology. I'd oh, rather dress birds in the yard, but the blood lures beasts. Sometimes the folks from creeks bring us meals, but we need to take care of ourselves. She throws the bloody cloth back into the bucket, making a splash, and then sits down on a stool, making it look like it was made for a doll. She rests her elbow on the table and looks you in the eyes. Her voice is warm, yet intrusive. So, who am I dealing with? I introduce myself. The bottle removes its seal seemingly by itself. The wax floats in the air briefly and then lands on the table gently. Without a word, she pours a thick liquid into the cups with her only hand, but doesn't offer you your drink just yet. So, what should we tell her about our purpose here? Um, 
I'm going to need shelter every now and again. I stay on the road most of my days. I think that's probably a fair one. She approaches a window above the table and looks outside. Your beast won't make it easy for us, dear. She places her hand on the shutters. It's not a city in. I don't cook for a smile. I don't work to feed and feel a noble. To feel noble. I allow folks to lie down there for free. She points to the bear fur with her broad chin, but that's about it. If your horse stays outside, lure the beast to us. But if we move it here upstairs, it'll leave its droppings on my floor. She gets annoyed by the idea of it even happening. If you want to rest here, love, be ready either to pay with a coin or some food rations, or to spend the night keeping your mount quiet. And clean it. Clean after it in the morning, will you? She gives you a wide grin and moves back to the stool. Hi now, go ahead, enjoy your drink. You raise the cup to your nose. You smell flowers, yeast and hops. The liquid is golden on the edges, but resembles red amber in the centre. It's as thick as a herbal medicament. You look at your companion, seeking a hint of what's expected of you. In some places, people gulp down their mead, but your vessel allows you to appreciate the aroma. The huge keeper smiles and takes a sip. You follow her lead, the drink touches your lips. It's warm, hiding none of its subtleties. Drinking mead is a never-ending conflict between holding the taste in your mouth and saving yourself from the tormenting sweetness of honey. I quite like mead. Uh, yet the flavours of flowers are just as present, too difficult to capture just yet. Foggy leans forward with an elbow resting on the table. Well, for me, it's a lazy morning. At least the rain spare us, so nicely holding on to the nights. Uh, what's the story behind this place? It's our third summer under the roof of Foggy Lake, but the palisade is older. Used to be a camping spot for the bird catchers from creeks. And there are fish here that don't swim in our streams. When we were but newcomers in the north, these lands were hard to bend, but the beasts got used to us in time. A melancholy crawls into her eyes. She observes the mead in her cup. Every year or so, we added something new. The rocks for a campfire, some stools, a fence, a firewood shed, a boat. At one point, we brought the lumber from White Marshes and built a cabin, like the one on the eastern road. More folks were resting here, even traders from Gale Rocks and Old Pagos. Plenty fine spot for an inn, eh? Her smile is warm. I'm building my home from nothing, you could say, and not for the first time. How about you? Does any of it sound tempting? Uh, what should we say about our ideal place to settle down? My home is wherever I can find kind people. She chuckles. Oh, you can always find some folks who are somewhat kind some of the time. But all of them have their limits or bad days. Without a place to return to, you're missing out on souls and their stories. She looks you in the eyes with motherly concern. Or who knows, maybe you're different. Uh, how do you stay safe from the beasts? You're completely open from the lake. Quick legs, love! Her brief yet thunderous laughter makes you flinch. We don't leave any food outside, but our cauldron smells. Every now and then something scary shows up. We lock ourselves here for days if we have to. Our windows help us keep a ki an eye on the yard. Better than this leaving this hamlet to goblins. You mentioned that having no wall from the lakeside is quite a risk. She nods in agreement and takes another sip. We don't bring children and old folks around, but this part of the peninsula is not so bad. At least in sunlight. Not much food growing or running around unless you can live on fish and birds. And the folks at Creeks are great hunters. The greatest around. But isn't there a harbour in the city as well? How do you keep the creatures away? Um... Should I say it's actually... Uh, no, let's say every now and then something large shows up between the boats or enters the streets. People learn to run away and leave it to the soldiers, but from time to time there are casualties. She asks you to tell you more, then taps her chin. Still safe for the living in villages, I'd say. Every other season, a hunter or a farmer lands on a pyre or disappears into the fogs. But a place of this size should have a way to stay stronger. I lived in the capital before the invasion. Having things in such state would make the folks revolt. Any interesting beasts you hunt for? Oh, I hunt for nothing. She smokes. Not since I lost my arm. And the boys outside are not made for it either. They've no drive to fight, you see. They grew up to be wimps. They sometimes club down her hair, but we're all about foraging and bird traps now. The folk in creeks do the real hunting. She adds after a pause. Runners, mouflons, rats, sometimes a buffalo or a saurian. We have no soil for fields, so game meat is all we've got left. She stretches out, getting even taller. Do you hunt often? Um, sometimes I set up traps. I don't f risk facing big game. 
basically fish. <laughs> That's hardly a hunt, is it? She leans forward, chuckling. Picking up a dead bird from a loop is not the same as pushing away a warm corpse that was just pinning you down to the ground. She looks towards the open window shutters. Not the same, but probably smarter. A friend of mine was a real huntress for a year or so. Uh, what brought you to the north? Uh, once you burn enough dead friends and relatives, clean tables start to look plenty tempting. She leans forward and takes another look at her bottle, sealing it with an approving nod. My ma and pa were both big, big and strong. One time they saw me sitting on this kid, twisting his arms. They started to teach me. Staff jewels, running, lifting barrels and rocks. Thankfully, the army chieftain said I wasn't disciplined enough. She rubs the scars on her forehead. So I did a lot of things. Escorted some merchants, joined a group of adventurers, hunted for bounties, guarded a village temple. The last memory makes her voice gloomy. Not all of these things make me proud of myself. She smells the mead in her cup, but doesn't take a sip. I moved here only after I lost my arm. When the folks were fleeing the invasion, I took my Ilan, casket of dragons, and joined a more organized group. Arm or not, I still have a fierce punch. She lets out a pleased grunt. I was worth keeping around. Her voice can't hide that she's delighted to carry on with her tale. Now that the years are catching up with me, and even more so with my back, I need to build myself a decent shelter. I crave no adventures, but I'm happy to hear stories from other restless souls. In the meantime, I'll practice this little trick. She points to the cauldron in the middle of the room and starts to make circles with her finger. Uh, the ladle mimics the movement, mixing the stew for another minute or two. Uh, that's also good for my back. Um, so you can move things with your thoughts? She chuckles. Hoi, can't you? I know some tricks, but not that one. I tell her about my amulets. She pays great attention to the ways you've obtained your talismans and how they affect your spellcasting. Oh, in my family, it was nothing like that, she says after a good couple of minutes. My grandparents used to be great mages, but not great enough to survive the plague. Her scarred lips form a grimace, and my ma got no talent from them. After a year of training, she was hardly able to push a feather from a distance of a foot. I always knew I had a strong soul in my blood, but there was no soul there to teach me how to use it. She examines her cup. The ladle stops, ladle stops moving. Now I try to figure it out all by myself, but without a teacher, I may not have enough summers left to become a master. Um, I'm not towards the spot where her right arm should be. Any story there? She leans back, moving her shoulders and chest up and down as if she's having a soundless chuckle. <laughs> not one I'm going to share with a newcomer, dear. Stay alive till next autumn. I'll open a cask of cold cider and tell you quite a tale. It has treason, treasure, monsters, and dark spells. But I'm way too sober for it now. She grabs her cup. Her wink turns into an awkward blink. Um, can we change the topic? Okay, well, I'm looking for Sterion, the previous road warden. She looks at you for a longer moment without the slightest movement. And why do you think he's here? I'm not saying I do, but maybe you know where I can find him. Ah, I misunderstood you. She shakes her head and leans on the table. I don't know his whereabouts. He didn't tell me a thing more than I needed to hear. Uh, when was the last time you saw him? She glances at a window. Same as the others in the late days of spring. We were waiting for his return, me and all the villages, then moved on. I've no idea where he went. All the villages, you say? She turns towards you with the fierceness of a bear. That's what I said. Did he do any jobs for you? She's pressing her tongue against her cheek and lips. Well, I'm not sure. He was bringing me news or delivering my messages. Sold me some stuff. Sometimes brought a thing or two, or bought a thing or two. His life wasn't really that riveting. Just another mug guzzler, sitting in the corner, patching his clothes. Did he sell you anything unusual? She stares at you without blinking. Such as what? Um, something he found in a weird place? Such tales stay between me and my guests. She nods towards the wall that separates you from the lake. This place may be open, maybe too open, but it guards secrets just fine. What can you tell me about him? She rests her only hand across her stomach, which you identify as her version of crossing her arms. A customer and an errand runner. What's there to say? Your additional questions don't get many more answers. She brings up the man's looks and equipment without adding much to what you've already learned from Tulia. He was paying with dragons? Rarely bartered, she adds. That's what city folk do, I. Seeking riches and locking themselves in a chamber, prisoners of their might. I shrug, I see no problem with that. 
Sure you don't. You can hide away from the Awoken and the Beasts, but having a safe life is the dream of the fools. The next plague, the next war, the next dragon will come. There's nowhere we can hide but a pyre. You don't sound very bothered by his disappearance. You see me as someone eager to make friends with a vagabond. I'll take it as a compliment to my skills as a tavern keeper. Her accent's gone wild. Folks come and go, their faces disappear. Friends die in my arms. She pauses. Families fade away. There was a different road warden years ago, and there's another one now. But there's only one Foggy in the north, and one Ilan, that slow son of mine, and one Creeks. I have only so many tears to spare. I'm looking for work. She grins. I somehow doubt you're here to forage for me, love. Not that I have any room for another soul, let me think. She runs her eyes over the shelves and the trophies, but it's the rocks surrounding the fireplace that catch her attention. The folks at Old Pagos are weirdly quiet. They were supposed to drop two wagons of rocks at my place. Can you check on them, just to find out if they're fine? You mentioned the payment. Oh, it won't take much work from a rider. You can get there and back in less than a day. Just ride west of here until you get to the crossroads and then another one. Turn west again and you'll find the village. Let's give you, say, I'll give you, let's say, a dragon bow. You mentioned that it's not much, but she weighs it off. A road warden should get familiar with all the villages anyway, right? Just do this when you have a chance. I'll have more coins for you once you can be trusted with the simpler tasks. I bring news from Olpagos. They're not good. Get the money. Listening to your tale, she rubs her forehead. Well, not what I was hoping to hear, love, but I'm glad you went there. Better warn the other settlements. Folks should know before they send their own messengers. It's going to be a rough few seasons for all of us. She pulls out a dragon bone from her pocket and tosses it, tosses it in your direction. Here, good job. She steps towards the ajar door and looks at the lake. Do you want me to do anything else? Uh, she scratches the stump of her missing arm. Her powerful voice carries a hint of a threat. I need a soul who can handle a delicate task. And I'm not sure it's you, dear. Okay, she doesn't trust me enough yet. Um, anything about the bandits in the north? She makes an annoyed grimace. What can I tell you? Tell you, dear. You're, you know how it goes. Lost souls need a new path after an awfulness finds them. But the years go by and it doesn't get any easier. One day they take a pile of firewood, another one some bread and clothes. After that they start hunting folks and there's no way back, even if they're not at all cruel. You ask her some more, but she's reluctant to give you straightforward answers. You don't have to worry about Glaucia's band. They hunt, sometimes take this or that, scavenge after folks who get jumped by beasts. But she never tried to threaten my place. You're safe here, and why would they try to bother a road warden? She may be right. Maybe some bandits are just desperate. I mean, no one has said they've been at all threatened by Glaucia just yet. Her scarred lips form a grimace of a smile. Um... Do you have anything useful for sale? Now you're talking. She grins. Well, I could serve you some of my cooking. Not food rations, mind you. You need what we can save for the winter season. Uh, let's say you give me a dragon, and in return I'll cook for you four times. You just need to ride up when you're hungry, and after that, uh, you won't take any wood or stone, are you? Seeing you shrug, she waves it off and heads towards the trapdoor. After a minute, she shows up with a sack that clangs after every step. I can sell you some scraps. She pulls out a couple of iron clasps, nails, and a broken steel blade. A value trash. I'm not sure what that means. Uh, we found them while foraging. We don't have a furnace in creeks, but you could sell these bits and pieces to someone else. She observes you for a moment and shrugs. Let's discuss the price. Let me take a look first. So... We could buy some meals in advance. We... I want to, would that give me extra vitality? That's what I need to know. Or I could buy a set of bits and pieces and maybe take them to the next town or um, one of the other towns I visited, maybe Howler's Dell, and sell them. Maybe make a profit on them. I mean, I have, I have food. I've got three rations left, haven't I? Uh, let's let's go with this for now. Um, I think that's pretty much it for here. Um, there's no need to rest yet. I've still got 10 hours before dusk, but it might be a good place for me to come back to. Um, I could wash myself in the lake. That might be a nice idea. Oh, okay. <laughs> you enter the bridge and move to its edge. Somewhere below you, you notice a glimmer. Uh, hey, you! Step back! Run! Without even thinking, you leap towards the yard. A long, teeth-filled mouth breaks through the water surface, splashing it in every direction. It bites the empty place where you were just standing, while the front limbs, thick, scaled, and ending with claws as large as your fingers, land on the wood. 
Once the saurian's yellow eyes notice that you're outside of its reach, it nonchalantly slides into the lake. You hear laughter coming from the yard. The large forager who's wearing leather was running with help, but now stands with hands on his thighs. I think it was running to help. But now stands with hands on his thighs, cackling without rest. The man in black fur, on the other hand, looks at you with worry. You see a hand kept beneath his cloak as if he was reaching for something. What are you doing, eh? The lake isn't for outsiders. I gasp for air and uh, thank him for the warning. I'll stay away, don't worry. He nods and gestures for his companion to cut it. They both move towards the gate. I approach the foragers. Once the man in black fur hears your steps, he nudges his companion and nods towards you. They put away the old noose traps they were trying to fix, proper for hares and small birds. The tall one spreads his arms, thundering his loud welcome. A road warden, I. I guess we're going to see each other a lot. I, Milan, and this shorty here is... Oh, goodness. Zvai. The man in the black fur looks up, frowning. Uh, there's also a third man. Unlike the rest of the staff, he has an unkempt beard and worn clothes made of blue fabric, patched with scraps of flour sacks. He has only the right hand, though unlike the tavern keeper, he's kept the rest of his arm. He's looking down to examine a trap, but his shoulders are slumped, eyes absent. Ilan doesn't introduce him. So boring, nice to meet you. Zvai stares at the hourglass hanging from your neck. What's with the wings? His grating voice is uniquely inquisitive. Are you a missionary? Um, I laugh. Not at all. Many people wear these in Hovlevan. He frowns. So you're just wearing it for no reason? I'm expressing my belief, sure, but I don't try to convert anyone. Is that so? Mm. He growls, but his eyes soften. Ilan puts on an unconvinced smile. You may want to take it off while you're not in the city. You won't find many allies in the north other than old Pagos and Gale Rocks. Folk around here have their own traditions. The third man gives you a curious glance. You're brave to wear the blessed sign, he whispers, but the right needs souls willing to fight in their name. Zvai rolls his eyes, but the man goes on. The pagans look at us, judge our lips and hands. We ought to be brave. Don't throw away your salvation. Think of what the tribe of the Southern Valley did centuries ago, when they hid their hourglasses to buy ibexes from the Ice Clan. Here's the accent of the city folk, same as yours. If it happens, it happens. Be at peace, Road Warden, he says with a smile and reaches for another trap. His gestures are quicker and more confident. Zvai looks at you both in silence, and once Ilan speaks, you notice his fake smile. Uh, were you at the Pelt of the North, friend? He blushes. How's uh, Dalit doing? Is she the one with the yellow armor? She's well. Seems to keep the whole crew together. Oh, that's her. Lovely color. A lively color, I. <laughs> yellow? He smiles, but you catch a hint of envy in his voice. Better say hi to her for us. <laughs> her boss was looking for hard drinks and healing potions. I wish I could have helped her. He glances at his companion, who's currently observing a column of ants running along the side of the palisade. They were offering good prices, and she was really good at dice, <laughs> and told us about so many monsters. Zvi adjusts his black cloak. Our oh, traps won't fix themselves. What brings you to us? Ilan frowns at this interruption, but says nothing. Uh, what's your plan? I could use some work. Zvi nods, and Ilan's voice gets even louder. Glad to hear that. Uh, we're planning to do some bird catching, a hunt without killing. Maybe not today, but in five days, maybe a bit later. What do you say? Um, how much do you pay? I mean, it may be a scary trip, but it won't take that long. Ilan shrugs. Just show up here at noon or before it. We'll be back in a few hours. You'll get five dragons, uh, two if the bird dies. Uh, that's a good price for one afternoon, I. Uh, yeah, okay. Ilan glances at the cords used for snares. All oh, these won't do. We want to catch a runner. This big. He raises his muscular arm and stops it maybe a foot above his head. And bring it here alive. We want its meat for later. The man with one hand interrupts him. His voice is weak but disdainful. Beasts ought to be dealt with, not tamed. Bonding with monsters brings only death. It will bring us full bellies in winter, squawks Vi. Uh, what's your plan exactly? Ilan grabs a rope and shakes it in front of you. Well, we'll catch its neck. Your part would be to keep it from running. Don't hurt it, just make it busy enough for us to surround it. Um, I can't leave my horse behind. Oh, I wouldn't worry about it. Ilan waves a hand just like his mother. Oh, the, the idiot would take care of it. The one-handed man starts to object, but a harsh shut-up from Zvi makes him sigh. His shoulders sag. 
Ilan goes on. He's a loony and would stumble over his own feet on a trip, but does what he needs when told. And you know he won't steal it. He hates animals. Um, yeah, okay, I'll be back in five days. Ilan grins. Oh, do so. We still need to prepare and you'd better do so as well. Uh, but don't make us wait for long. Let's not test the bird's patience. Just come one day before afternoon. So... Uh, if we come around 30 days before autumn, we should be able to do this uh, this hunt. I turn towards the one without a hand. Do you know Julia? The man gives you a surprised glance, but then looks down and crosses his arms, holding his hand under his shoulder. I'm a new man now. There's nothing that ties me to the army. You've crossed a great part of this land, greater than most. Have you seen anything unusual? So he's the one who lost... Uh, do you remember at the very beginning... The first episode, the uh, soldier, the lieutenant in the soldiers' camp, told us about a guy who'd lost his hand and ran away. Well, this is uh, this is him, clearly. He takes a deep breath. His voice is close to a whisper. There's fog in my soul. I was on the eastern road, hungry and sick, praying for the right to send its beasts on me and save me from the pains of living. I remember the touch of fur and the breath on my neck, the claws pinning me to the ground. I was waiting with my eyes closed. Then I woke up in the middle of the night, still feeling. I got back on my feet, walking until I reached the lights of this tavern, without so much as a bruise. Foggy may have no faith in her heart, but the right used her kindness to give me a second chance. Ilan frowns at the man's words, but there's cautiousness in his voice. He may be crazy, but it's true he came here after midnight, raving. Maybe the monsters don't like his scent. So you forgot everything. He hides his stump in the palm of his hand and calls up. I've seen a dragon eating a tree, an ape that tore away the head of a monstrous cat, and a wolf without fur that was as quick as lightning. Now leave me alone, evil spirit. Let my shame rest. He's shaking. Let him be, eh? Zweigrok grunts at you. Nothing wrong about a man trying to forget. Ilan rubs his chin. A furless wolf friend. I've heard about one. Our tribes folk saw it in the heart of the woods. Nasty beast. Let's hope it won't find a mate for breeding. It charges at you like a runner and jumps right at your throat. He touches his neck, so even the hunters stay away from it. Too bad we've got no crossbows. He raises his wooden club. Oi, better to avoid the deep woods without one. Okay, so we pretty much all we can do is walk away. Uh, and let's uh, travel, I guess. Got another ten hours before we need to rest. So choice of three directions. Do we go north? There is supposed to be a fishing village in the north. I, they mentioned somewhere called... I can't remember. But I think there must be another village quite nearby. Let's, tell you, let's go north, because uh, maybe we'll hit the top coast. You follow the road spread between the hills and lonely trees until you reach a solid wooden bridge, not older than a generation. You ride uphill, but Roach manages to keep up. The dark woods in the south are behind a gently humming creek, while the forest on your right was trimmed by the locals. It's a peaceful journey, at least for some time. After a few minutes, you spot a group of wolves feasting on a fallen furry beast. Maybe a wizent. One of them looks towards you. We're going to ride a little bit faster. Ooh. The road fades into an old tunnel. There are no signs of mining, no signposts, no human voices. The ceiling is supported by wooden beams, but the light reaches only so far. The chilling wind mercilessly bends the few lonely trees, while the shrubs oppose the weather patiently. The side path leading west is somewhat maintained, and you find both bootprints and cart tracks. It leads higher into the mountains. Hmm. I tether roach to a tree and enter the tunnel. Please don't die. Um, you, your mount observes the area anxiously, so you stay for a moment to give it a good scratch under its neck and say something confident. And say some confident sounding rubbish. You unpack all the things you need to make a new simple torch. A log, some old rugs, a bit of oil. You grab your tinderbox and sit on the ground for a couple of minutes, preparing the flint and the linen char cloth. Decades ago, before the southern invasion, people used fire strikers made of thick steel, but all you have is a cube-like piece of, piece of harsh pyrite. It's not the best, but it's enough to make a couple of sparks. The loud flickering yellow light unevenly hits your cheek with heat. You raise the torch, but hold it at an angle, letting the oil drip on the ground. Let's see where the tunnel leads. Please don't die. Oh god, it looks big. 
<sighs> okay, don't die, don't die, don't die. For a few minutes, you follow a fairly straight corridor. The timber supporting the ceiling is decaying, but you don't spot any signs of collapse. The floor is littered with bones and rotting food, most likely dragged in here by wild beasts, but there are also signs of soot above you and boot prints left on the dried mud. You reach at the crossroads and stop in place. There's no sconce in sight, so you'd have to constantly carry the torch or lose it for good, and it won't last for long anyway. The draught is hardly noticeable, so looking for an exit in the dark could be dangerous. Uh, but my, my lantern should last long enough. You place a candle on the ground and then light it up with another few sparks from your tinderbox. You shove it inside the lantern through the hole in its top, pressing it onto a nail. You shake it for a bit, making sure it will stay standing. The candle isn't as bright as your torch, but it's safer, will last longer, and can easily be replaced by another one. I go deeper. The road ahead is like the one you just crossed, a human-carved straight corridor supported with beams, while the other paths are curved and narrow. The only light comes from the exit, minutes away from here. So we can look around, turn left, right, go forward or exit, so let's look around. The remains of prey and fruit are rotting, but get sparser the deeper you enter the tunnel. The moist walls are shining, as if they're made of an ore unknown to human tribes. You observe the dried trails. The ones left by boots lead towards both corridors. The path to your right also has marks left by hooves and wheels. Some of the fresher trails leading deeper into the tunnel resemble, resemble human souls, but deformed, lacking skin between their toes. Okay, so forward could be dangerous. Let's go uh, right, where it seems quite populated. The corridor is unlike the others, taller and more rounded, with claw marks on the walls. It leads you to a chamber with a ceiling supported by a single beam. There's also an abandoned cart, the fence of an animal pen and a few long sticks and planks. You take a glance at the new exit. It leads slightly upward and looks a bit like stairs. Okay, let's search the room. You find no cache caches or boxes and the cart is empty. The one thing that draws your attention are the planks and logs themselves. They're in decent shape, flexible, though too moist to be worth carrying out of the cave. They could be turned into a new door or maybe a table. Let's go upstairs. You flinch after the light touches the resting bone, but nothing tries to jump at you and you hear no shuffling feet. You step forward and take a closer look at the remains of the massive creature. It used to be two times as long as your palfrey, three if you were to count the hind limbs. It resembles a bear, but its skull has no sharp teeth and is of a different shape. Let's take a closer look. The ribs of the creature are as long as your own trunk, though the age makes them brittle. You observe the long legs, horse-like head, and the massive stomach. You can't tell if you've ever seen such a beast alive, but surely not its trophies. Huh. A part that's uniquely sharp are the creature's claws. They could pierce two sides of your skull at once, as curved as a war pick and as heavy as an axe, and the marks on the walls perfectly match them. While impressive, they're too old and awkward to be turned into tools. All right, let's leave the chamber. Uh, let's leave that chamber. Let's go left. The air in the chamber is humid. The straw beds are covered with mould and the sagging racks are bending under their own weight. The animal pelts on the floor release a terrible stench. Hmm. Let's search the room carefully. Ooh. Using an old walking stick, you push the furs and mattresses aside and you spare your gloves from touching the sticky odds and ends by wrapping them with a cloth. You find only one thing of value, hidden in a rare dry bowl pushed to the side of a shelf. A tiny ring made of bone. Not a coin, but a piece of jewellery, still elegant, with a distinguished carving of a fish on top and scales on its side. Ooh, I don't want to put that on. Bone ring. Uh, can't do anything with it. Um, it's pretty much been described already. Meant to be worn on a large finger. Okay. We can't wear it ourselves, but maybe we can uh, sell it. I guess we leave the chamber. Now, I'm going to quick save because we might die. Uh, let's go forward. You forge ahead for another few long minutes, no longer able to see the light from the exit. You would need to stand on someone's shoulders to touch the ceiling. So far, you could ride through the tunnel without getting out of the saddle. The sound of a stream is reaching you from ahead. This time there are no side paths. Let's move forward. The stream has formed a wide pond. You stab it in a few spots, but it turns out to only be a finger or two deep. Now, there's no sign of a bridge. 
I crouch and take a closer look at the water. It's clean, but the dark rocks and lack of light camouflage its soft, sand-like bed. You find a few fish bones and other remains, but with every step you disturb the sediment, further clouding the water. The water flows from your right to the left. The trail is wide enough to follow, at least for a few steps, and so tall you can do so without crouching. So we can go ahead, or we can leave, or we can follow the water. Let's follow the water. Ooh. The corridors become less spacious after just a few steps, but you manage to take a good look around, moving both with and against the flow. The wet walls are home to worms, mould, and what looks like pale spiders, though only with six legs. Among the commotion you spot a cave ear sticking out of the wall, a familiar though unfriendly mushroom, a creamy colour distorted by your light. Uh, you grab your knife and cut away what seems like the least bug-infested chunk, and after wrapping it with a linen sheet you wash your hands. Uh, the cave ear is used by some fighters to enhance their senses in combat. You may want to take it to an alchemist. Yeah, let's keep moving forward. The open door to your right leads into a narrow corridor. You take a look further down the tunnel. A cave-in broke the timber, blocking the path forward. Uh, let's go through the door. It squeaks. The corridor resembles the interiors of a fortress with flat, regular walls and a ceiling so low you couldn't ride through it. You reach another, much larger chamber which seems to mimic the corridor style, and our only choice now is to enter. The spoiled food and mouldy planks make you hold your breath. The chamber used to serve as a dining spot with tables, chairs, shelves for mugs and barrels of drinks, but all that's left are worms and mustiness. You don't see the furthest wall until you bring your light closer. The open door leads to a new natural cavern. Another closed door is in the corner of the room opposite the one you came from. Well, let's search the chamber first. Hang on, hang on. Um, okay, so there's two doors. There's an open door leading to a new cavern and another closed door. Let's search this chamber first. Ooh. The place was abandoned in haste, but you find no signs of large creatures, bones or destruction. The wood gives way only to time. A few of the barrels still contain liquids, though you wouldn't dare open them. Close to the exit leading to a cave, you find a hook with a simple iron key. You pick it up, and it stains your hand with rust. Let's try to open the door in the corner. The door gives way. The next room is also too large for your light to reach all the corners at once. The empty shelves, chests, and spear racks give you no promise of a hidden treasure, but you also find a box with rusty nails cracked barrel in the corner and a broken blade. You could spend some time collecting these and other iron scraps and then sell them in a village. In the room's corner you notice a wide sheet of mouldy fabric that covers a large part of the wall. Uh, let's collect the metal scraps. Having no useful tools at hand you struggle to dismantle the barrel and cut away all the bits of woods that are attached to the pieces of iron and steel. After a long while you prepare a decent clanging sack. For now you move it to the dining chamber and leave it by the exit. We can examine the curtain. It's divided in the centre, allowing you to draw it. Behind it, you find a tiny room, maybe two steps wide and three steps deep. It's silent and not as humid. The wall ahead isn't like the others. It's covered with red and purple bricks. Now, let's look for anything unusual. Ooh, the walls to your left and right bear a few iron hooks that could be used to hang cloaks, paintings or trophies. The corners aren't too dusty and there are no footprints on the floor. You inspect the brick wall further. In its centre, at chest height, you spot a distinctive engraving. It's a winged hourglass, about a finger long. Uh, so here, I can touch the shape of the hourglass with a pendant I own. It's a match. You fit it into the grooves and then press. The brick moves deeper inside and then bounces back, allowing you to draw it out completely. In the secret compartment, you find a key made of bronze. It's as large as your forearm. Okay, let's leave the room. Uh leave the room. Okay, so that was the armory. Let's go through the open door. The cave is so moist that the diggers placed planks on the ground, serving as a now useless bridge through the puddles. The rock shaped like icicles ominously hang from the ceiling, in some spots merging with their on-the-floor counterparts and forming hourglass glass-like columns. It mentions try to open the door. I'm not sure which door that means. Let's search the chamber first. 
Uh, you leave the rotten planks and explore the cavern carefully, making the light dance in the droplets and puddles, but you find nothing of use or value. Okay, let's try to open the door. The door opens quietly, and you return to the main tunnel. You could turn south again and see if there's anything you missed, but after you blink a few, a few times, you realise there's light at the end of the tunnel far ahead. It's weak and flickers, like a torch. Okay, so that was a cave-in, so... Let's hide our own light. You simply put it on the ground in the entrance to the cavern with the stalactites. You'll pick it up if you need it. Let's move closer to the light. You put away your light and sneak forward. You pay attention to sounds and movements, but there's no crackling of a campfire, no wandering or chatter. You see a shape of a gate far in the distance. Um, let's look for anything unusual. Though you do so in almost complete darkness, you notice something blocking your boot. You crouch and tuck the, touch the long cord, stretched right above the ground, in a few spots holding pieces of wood and bone that are meant to make a sound if disturbed. Ooh, it's a little alarm trap. You cut it carefully, putting the remains of the trap on the floor. Okay, let's, let's go closer to the light. Slowly but surely, you reach the edge of the light, but don't dare to get any closer. The distinctive shadows belonging to unmoving, human-like shadows that have no flesh on their necks and chests, only the bones. You move back, there may be three undead there, if not more. You could prepare some surprises in the tunnel to slow them down or even weaken them, but who knows how easy it will be to outsmart them. I better speak with someone who knows how to set traps. Uh... Let's, let's just explore this little bit of south tunnel. Um, you reach the other side of the cave-in, getting a good view of its si at its size. You find a new door here. It's a bit tilted, closed and soggy. Uh, let's try to open the door. Got a couple of keys. Uh, the, okay, yeah, so it says the small iron padlock won't budge, but we can use the key we found in the dining chamber. So let's try that. After a bit of wiggling, the padlock gives in. The door lets out a quiet sigh and you enter a humble cave that's been turned into a storeroom. Your light reveals crates, a pile of timber, a stack of rocks, and another of bricks. Let's search. You move the building materials aside, taking note of the somewhat dry timber, but the first thing of use you find are the tools stored in one of the crates. The crude axes, hammers, chisels, pickaxes, and digging bars are all old and made of rocks, antlers, and bones. Though they're worthless, you move a few of them closer to the tunnel. If necessary, you'll know where to find them. Hmm. So I think pretty much the only thing we haven't done here yet is deal with these undead. We're basically dead ourselves, so it seems like a bad idea to do that right now. Let's go back to Rage. We'll come back here if we learn a bit more about setting proper traps. Have I got my little sack of bits and bobs? I say two. I'm not sure if that means that's the. Uh, I've, I've picked up what I found. Why can I make a set of earplugs? Interesting though. I'm just going to enter the tunnel again because it did say I put my sack down, didn't it? Um, it doesn't say anything about. Um, picking it up though, so I'll assume I've got it. Right, so it is five hours before dusk. If we were to travel, it's going to take us an hour to get back to Foggy Lake. We can still push further north. The detour is not as smooth as the main road. A wagon could make it through, but even so, you have to squeeze between some narrow corridors, hoping no beast is going to jump at you from a ledge. You walk, leading your mount with an axe in your hand. In the middle of the road, after reaching one of the higher hills, you take a glance ahead. Even from here you see the sun reflecting from the ocean, but there's also a pillar of smoke some coming somewhere from the distant west. There may be a volcano somewhere behind the horizon, but you can't tell if it's a part of the peninsula, or maybe a yet stranger land. Ooh, anything's making noises. Once you get to the other side of the mountain, you find the northern entrance to the tunnel, blocked by a large bronze gate. So tall and wide, you're not sure if it's something you could open with your muscles alone. There's a keyhole as well, as large as your hand. 
Uh, we could unlock the tunnel. Uh, again, let's quick save. I don't know if uh, loads of undead are going to come running out at me when I do this. You get a good look at the village from a distant hill. It's torn between taming the crags and succumbing to their whims. The grey boulders are like the rotting teeth of a giant, sprinkled around by an ancient spirit. The carved cave mouths are covered with wooden doors. There are only a few windows and you can only imagine how dark and cold the gouged out rooms have to be. The buildings and walls made of logs or stone blocks must be much younger than the caves. The impressive whitewashed keep standing on top of the hill in the west could just as well have been built in the city. Smoke rises from both sides of the wild river. You see many busy souls as they go about moving tools, food and timber over the bridge. Your arrival at the eastern gate causes some curious glances, but the only person who approaches you is a man who is sitting at a table, discussing something with a few elders. He's carrying a crossbow on his back and a long rusty knife at his side, but he doesn't reach for them. It must be a guard, I dismount. I hope there's a healer here. The man has to be older than 40. He wears an elegant blue-green linen tunic, but no armour. His skin is yellowish, like a seaweed seen through a sunbeam. His long hair is tied with a ponytail, and his beard is trimmed to half a finger of length. A few large cysts make him look sickly, but his powerful, truculent voice adds to him strength and confidence. Um, Cheer, stranger. You've reached Gale's Rock, you did. He observes your mount and then looks at the path behind you. I see no caravan from here. Are they coming? He suddenly meets your eyes and his tone gets even harsher. Or are you here to idle about? I listen to the nearby conversations. You have to get used to some of the local words and phrases that you've only heard coming from the mouths of the oldest of city folk. The vast similarities to the tongue of Hovlevan only makes these differences more distracting. Uh, let's be friendly. We could joke. Can we be serious? Actually, let's be serious. I'm a road warden. I'm here to solve problems, not cause them. Another road warden, eh? Are all them parents in the south too dumb to teach their kids to keep their fingers in their own pots? He shakes his head with exaggerated emotions and looks at the elders at the table. A road warden! See that? Trying to cut the conversation short, you lead Roach inside. But you're stopped right away. Leave it by the walls until it's nightfall, right? We ain't cleaning our roads after any drifters, bards, or adventurers. He speaks with growing disgust. Don't worry, we'll keep an eye on it. You tether your horse to the stems of a shrub and the man nods with approval and then turns around. Uh, can you tell me anything about the village? He stops in place and then glances at your boots. Right, uh, we fish, we salt fish, we sell fish. Our brave ones trade barrels for whatever we can get at the other villages. But, he shrugs, not much else to it, you see. Life here is slow. Without another word, he returns to the group of elders where he helps one of them remove bones from their meal. You go to... Maybe there are some locals looking for a match in other villages. Okay. While the vast majority of the locals see this place as their home and even feel indebted to their families and neighbours for looking after them, Paulus seeks a different path. He isn't even 20, but trained to work on the beach is strong, slim and a bit loud. I can even hunt fish if that's the only work left, he admits when asked about his plans for the future. Just not here, not after all of their neighbours turned a blind eye toward my harpy of a mother. He reveals the scars on his back left by Willow with ease. You mention religion and he shrugs without a second thought. Him, yeah, I can do whatever, barring wicked spells. You make sure he means necromancy and blood magic. Right, all I want is a companion for the mornings and evenings, a woman with a kind soul, and if good winds allow us, to be the mother of our children. I'm ready to work for them till I faint. He flexes his muscles. I gauge my arm for that. Marina is a few years older, but much shorter, pale and with dark circles under her eyes. While she hopes to find a wife or a husband, she won't leave the village. I have a six-year-old. His father went into the fogs on a foraging trip. I'd love to have more kids, but my forebears have been living in this village for longer than anyone can tell, and I'd rather not make our blood too thick. You ask about what sort of traits she's looking for. Someone kind, loyal, serious, and diligent. No matter if they're a water carrier or an artisan. My own back is weak, it is, and it suffers after standing for long hours. I can help with fish smoking, cleaning, foraging, whatever there is to do. When asked about her conviction, she looks at you as if the question is beyond absurd. I won't lie with a lad or a lass that's a stranger to Wright's teachings. I tell Paulus what I've learned about Timo from Howlers. 
He asks uh, you a few additional questions, some of which are centred around Timo's face and figure and spoken with embarrassment, and then flashes you a wide smile. Right, she sounds dreamy. <laughs> if she's in, I'm in. Let me know what she thinks about me. I look for someone else. The smell of smoke, baked fish and cut herbs makes you more nauseated than hungry. You go to... I could still learn more about the wares this village has to offer, but why is that greyed out? Let's go to the gatekeeper. The guard you met when you first arrived at the village is leaning against the wall, observing both the gates and your mount. Whenever Roach snorts, the gatekeeper reaches for his axe. He sighs when he notices your gaze. What? I encountered undead in the tunnel south of here. Right, they almost got my wife, they did, when she tried to check out the locked passage. We stay away from there, but take talk to our digger. She's there with her toys. He steps away from the wall and looks at the nearest table, where an elderly woman is putting together a humble structure from wooden building blocks. Have you heard about the plague that has fallen upon old Pagos? The plague? His voice is close to a shout, and a few people glance towards the two of you. The guard grows pale. Better take, talk, take it to our head woman, Warden. We were planning to trade with them, we were. Uh, have you been bothered by pan bandits in recent seasons? Em? What do you mean, bandits? That useless group of soldiers already faced them half a year ago. Ain't you heard in Hovlevin? They killed and got killed. He shrugs as if there's nothing more to add. But you try to push him harder, sharing some of the gathered rumours. Glossier and her group? No, you're wrong. She's from here and wouldn't bother us or our neighbours. She's just one of the lost free folk. Couldn't force herself to come back here after uh, the events that can't be changed now. She's just hunting for treasures in the ruins, trading. That's where she gets her stuff and coins. In most settlements, people are more hospitable. He gives you an irritated glance and then stares into the river. Most settlements have fewer memories of getting robbed by drifters or of wasting their time on good-for-nothing adventurers. All them free souls think they have the right to our patience and care, as if they are some saviour of ours, each one of them. Well, we've been beaten this land for centuries with rights help and the patience of our forebearers, and if anyone wants our respect, they'd better work for it. When you notice that getting carried away with theft must not be an easy task, he answers slowly. Oh, don't get any weird ideas, outsider. It's easy to disappear in the hills or at the crossroads. We've got to be vigilant, more than our allies, the stonecutters at Old Pagos. They can't let themselves be more open to strangers. They have neighbours, gentler roads, and uh, less of a wall to defend. A young basket weaver with legs too short and thin for her to stand on scoffs at your question. Em, you don't even... Young basket weaver. Em, you don't even know her name or that we call her a headwoman. Like all them outsiders, you know nothing of our customs, yet you think you can bother us. Before you respond, she looks at the white building on the hill. She's in the keep. Scat! You head to the western bank and walk past the big kitchen. The steep path leads through an open, unguarded gate. As you look around the yard, you notice a few pigeons running around, keenly observed by a pet griffin tied to a wooden beam. Some drying underwear hanging from a rope, a spiked flail leaning against the wall carelessly, and a knocked-over bucket lying in a puddle of water. The place may be messy, but it's not as impaired in its function. Prepared it, preparing it for defence wouldn't take longer than a few minutes, and judging by the wall walk of the bailey, it could stand an attack from a large squad of soldiers. The current state of the place makes you think of Hovlevin, whose stronghold yards and temple walls are often surrounded by small peddlers, a few of which are even allowed to set up their stalls. As long as they don't hinder anyone else's tasks, they are allowed to pursue the scarce scraps of open space. I look at the keep. The bright walls stand out from the other structures in the village, and as far as you can tell, the current layer of whitewash is still fresh. There must be at least three floors inside, enough space to contain more than a hundred people though without much between them. There are arrow slits in the walls, and the roof is surrounded by a fence-like barrier, a perfect spot for boulder throwers and archers. The large entrance door is ajar, with a wrinkle wrinkled man sitting on a pillow placed on the stairs. He's not wearing a gambeson, but the fine steel sickle sword at his side makes it clear he's not just a regular guard. He stops what he was doing, carving a figurine from a log, and stands up to greet you. Uh, cheers, Road Warden. Severina was told about your arrival. Follow me. He may be old, but he is tall, with the long and thin arms of a sea folk, 
a neatly groomed beard and his grey hair in a ponytail. That made him sound very ancient. As you follow him, you're hit by the strong scent of cloves. The door is thick and can be barricade, barricaded with two wooden bars. The hall is filled with benches, some of which are placed on top of the others, giving a bit more space for now. There is one path to the next floor, suspiciously covered with planks. The chamber is free of the roaring of the river, the shouts of workers, the chaos of animals or the smell of cooked food. The room is well lit, both by sunlight and candles, and quite draughty, though you still smell perfumes and ageing wood. You doubt anyone lives here or even uses this room for dining. The road warden is here, says the guard and approaches the desk, standing between you and the old woman sitting behind it. I take a closer look. So far, she hasn't spared you as much of a, as a glance. She's writing on a large wax tablet with a stylus as large as a dagger. And since she's a bit stooped, you see only her, you only see her from the chest up. She's wearing a thick, warm dress, the colour of a cherry, an even darker, modest hat that's covering her hair. She could be older than 70, yet her face and hands have been spared from scars harsher than some pockmarks carved by illnesses. If you two were to encounter her in Hovland, you would expect her to be an official, or maybe a rich scribe. Some of her belongings, however, wouldn't be found at the city's desks. The wax of her tablet isn't dyed. Instead of keeping water in a cup, she has a large, colourful seashell, and the winged hourglass placed on a stone stand is made of dried seaweed. I glance at the young woman who sits in a corner. Her crossbow is pointing at you. The resemblance between her and the elder is stunning, though she's slim and a bit taller, and wears a simple dark blue and black woolen tunic. While she's resting on a chair, she looks at you almost without blinking, with hardly any movement, like a cat staring at a rat, trying to judge if you're defenseless prey or a threat. Alright, what's going to be our approach here? I think we'd be supportive and cordial. Uh, it's nice to meet you, Severina. I came here to see if your village needs any help from a road warden. She raises her violet eyes, but only for a moment. Where do you think you are, outsider? Some lost tribe desperate for help from adventurers and vagabonds? Our village carries blood older than your city it does, and we've endured hardships you couldn't imagine. Her accent is not as thick as that among younger villagers, keeping a shadow of the years when the guild had tighter ties with the peninsula. But since she has no teeth, you have to think of a moment before you recognise some of her words. Uh, better tell me what you want from my people and scat. Her face shifts into indifference, and, still holding her stylus, she once again bends over her tablet. This could be a, quite a long conversation. I am aware that this uh, this episode is also now getting along a little bit of a length, so I think before we launch into chatting with Severina here that we, uh, we call it a day at this point. And, um, yeah, we'll pick it up next time. So thanks very much for watching once again, everyone who is. I hope you're still enjoying the series. Uh, if you are, then please do hit the like button on the video and subscribe to the channel as well. That would be fantastic. And in the meantime, I hope to see you again for more Road Warden. Bye for now.